fused and merged with their narrative, their false self, and their grandiose, idealized sense of who they are, and you've imbibed it in order to be in the relationship. You must accept their narrative of who they are because you'll never get into an intimate relationship with a narcissist if you deny their fundamental narrative of who they are. I'm going to get my apologies in in the beginning of this video because I'm going to do two things that I think would really, really annoy people. Um, the first thing I'm going to do that I'm going to annoy people is I'm going to tell them how they feel and what they don't feel. And I just find this so rude. You know, if anybody ever says to me, um, this is what you're feeling, what you think you're feeling isn't what you're feeling. I know better than you what you're feeling and you feel X, Y, or Z. I just find that incredibly rude and irritating. It's such a boundary break to tell someone. You don't, you don't tell somebody what they feel. You ask them what they feel. And yet I am gonna tell you what you do and don't feel in this video. The second thing I'm gonna do that's really gonna wind people up because I think that in the online narcissism community, my observation is the majority of people like the sense that if they're bad, if the narcissist, the borderline, the psychopath is bad, then I'm good. If they're the perpetrator, then I'm the victim. And therefore I'm just, you know, I'm absolved of all guilt. I'm free from all sin. And I'm gonna say, actually what we most frequently would accuse the cluster B, the narcissist, the borderline of, uh, we're guilty of as well. And it's the following. Um, so you already know the narcissist doesn't love you. They're not capable of love and they can't really see you. They can only see a fantasy vision of you. Well, you don't really love the narcissist either. You're not granted that opportunity and you don't really see them because you're not granted that opportunity either. So I'm gonna say right off the bat, uh, you don't feel what you think you feel and you're, if, if an accusation or a stone that you're hurling at the narcissist is they don't see a person and they don't really love, uh, you're just, and, and that's an accusation that you think is, um, is a stone worth hurling, you're just as guilty, but for different reasons, for different reasons. Okay, so let's, let's start to um, break this down. So to the first accusation, um, you don't really love them. I have suspected for a long time, for uh, years in fact, that much of the angst and the obsession and the sort of, you know, you, you know where you're just so focused on somebody and there's so much hand wringing and there's so much nervous energy and anxiety about this person and about this situation. My intuitive sense when I'm observing others and I'm observing the same thing in myself because I've been in narcissistically abusive relationships, I've always been like, my intuitive sense is like, I'm not sure this is real. I don't know that you think what you th think you think. What? I don't know that you feel what you think you feel. So I was wondering for a long time, is there such a thing as artificially induced emotions in the narcissistic relationship? And then I did hand wringing over that. I'm like, I'm not sure. Um, how would we know? Is this a way of like uh, another next level, high level form of denial where you go, well, I never really loved them anyway. I never really felt that way about them anyway. What, what is this? And so uh, a week ago, I Instagrammed Sam Vaknin and I was like, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. I'm wrestling with this personally, I'm wrestling this, with this professionally. Is there such a thing? And he cited uh, a psychoanalyst called Sander, who wrote a paper in 1989 where he described the shared fantasy space. And Sam said, first of all, you should watch my videos on, first of all, he said, my name's Sam Vagnin, the author of Malignant Self-Love. <laughs> no, he didn't, he just said, he just said, check out these videos and, um, See what, see what I have to say about the shared fantasy space. Now there's, a, there's an excellent one uh, that describes the differences between the narcissist and the borderline shared fantasy space. I'm gonna describe the shared fantasy space as I understand it to you in just a moment, which I recommend. And I've put it in the more information bar below. It's really good, check it out. Since then, as I've thought about it and started reading about it and listened to Sam's videos, I was like, well, of course there's artificially induced emotions. 
Of course there is. When people come together, uh, to use the language that I would use rather than more psychoanalytic language, you have to blue pill to get through a relationship. And I don't say that dismissively. I don't say that like, oh, this is blue pill. This is for cowards. This is for people who can't face reality. Absolutely not. I mean it in the best way possible. I've always said nobody can live a totally red pilled life. You'd go mad. You need your dissociation. You need your daydreams. You need your fantasies. You need the Spanish concept of la ilusión. You need that fantasy that something you're moving towards the promised land, whatever it is, to enjoy daily life. And wouldn't you all agree that like when a relationship is good, let me know in the comments if you disagree, when it's good, it has this fantasy element to it. You feel protected, you feel comforted, you're inspired, you're motivated, you're seen and you're seeing, you're loved and you're loving. I mean, it's, it feels great. It feels, you know, it's probably like a peak human experience, but isn't it also true that it always has a fantasy element? I'm not being dismissive. I'm saying that we should engage in that. It's like saying, should a person sleep and dream? Well, if they don't, they'll go mad. That's not an outrageous claim. That's absolutely scientific. If a person doesn't sleep and doesn't dream, uh, what happens? Well, they begin to sleep while they're awake and they dream while they're awake. They have auditory hallucinations. They have visual hallucinations. They slip in and out of reality and eventually they go psychotic. They go mad because you must, biologically, you must dream. You must blue pill. You must submerge into the fantasy. So I'm not saying this is a bad thing. You must have a shared fantasy because it can't be just my fantasy with you. You would say, well, that's what narcissism is. Yeah, but you have to share it, right? The word here, the difficult bit is not the fantasy part. I just described that. We can all agree we need that. If you're going to be with somebody, you, you engage actively in uh, a fantasy, uh, kind of a role play with them, much like children. And that's another wonderful element of the relationship. You can, you have the safe space to be a little bit more infantile and a little bit more immature and open and vulnerable and so on. Shared. Shared. A bridge is built. We enter each other's space. Boundaries are dissolved. Can you think of anything more boundary dissolving that you can do with another human being other than sex? So the sexual act is the ultimate act of vulnerability and intimacy and the breaking of boundaries. Like, you know, I'd be upset if somebody I didn't know walked up to me and touched my face with their fingertip. Now you think about what you do during, <laughs> during sex. Obviously, you know the person, but my point is, I think we gloss over and we've normalized and we don't look at how boundary breaking normal sexual intimate romantic relationships are and therefore how psychologically perilous they are. And we do it like, yeah, it's normal. You know, I just had sex and I started dating and then I did, man, did, did, and I'm like, hey, you know when you like drive a car and you could crash and then the government mandates that you take a test and you're checked and you, you haven't, that, that license has like a, a it's, it's, it's kept on a government file somewhere that says you can do this because it's dangerous. This stuff is dangerous too, like dating sexing, mating, you know, pair bonding. It's pretty perilous stuff because it's so boundary breaking. So fine, we have the shared fantasy. We must blue pill. We must actively get together and have a shared fantasy for a relationship to work. But you're in a shared fantasy with somebody who is sick. You're, this is established, you know, is that an outrageous statement? No, so you're sharing a poisoned chalice, the chalice from the palace with the vessel, with the pestle. Which one has the brew that is true? You're sharing this poison chalice with somebody who's sick and their sickness dictates that they need to make you sicker through the romantic um, bridge, through the shared space. Their sickness dictates that they must abuse the shared space, the shared fantasy, to dominate you, to exploit you, and to extract what they need from you, which is supply. It's narcissistic supply. Next element to this, because I'm looking at them going, of course they can induce them. Like, why am I so dumb? Why am I so naive? Of course they can. Why don't I even wrestle with this? So a week of thinking about this, like, of course. 
Do you remember once I said, uh, oh, it's like years ago, like 2016, 2015, I said uh, maybe a useful metaphor for describing narcissist would be, uh, I got this from a sci-fi game, a sci-fi horror game that's out there. I don't know what it's called. But the, the, the creature you faced was um, not a creature at all. It was actually a cloud of nanobots that would form themselves into the per perfect nightmare to induce terror in you. So whatever would most induce terror in you, this cloud of nanobots would become that thing and induce terror in you. It's like button pushing to the next level. But that's how the narcissistic personality disordered individual functions. They're not coming from a core self. They're not coming from, this is me, let me share me with you. Because there isn't a self there. They're observing like a giant eye, like giant eye of Sauron. We're back to a lot of my old metaphors now. They're looking at you and they're looking at themselves and they're like, this is where they get tired, why they get distracted, why they get dissociated, because they're hypervigilant. They have to watch themselves perform, feedback to themselves how to change the performance while simultaneously watching you and anybody else who they believe is watching them to extract the response they're looking for. It's a completely different mode of being in the world. They're response extraction machines. They're emotional induction machines. So there's me, you know, naive codependent going, can they induce emotions in you? Can they induce reactions in you? It's like, yes, of course they can. That's what they do. That's what they're there for. That's, that's the, literally the only thing that they do. So yes. So building to my overall point here, you uh, are in a situation with somebody where you've, you actively, because this requires consent, you're actively sharing, you're, you're, you're in a shared fantasy space with them. You know that their personality disorder dictates that they have to abuse that shared fantasy space to extract supply from you. Then we've established that they're reaction inducing machines and their emotional button pushing machines in order to dominate you so that they can keep their source of supply in line, giving them what they need in order to survive. And then I come along and I'm like, so um, could they induce feelings of love and feelings of obsession in you that you don't really feel? Well, yeah, <laughs> of course. Why wouldn't they? One of my old assumptions, again, going back uh, four or five years ago, was I would say after the relationship ends, one of the things that we can assume when we're in recovery and we're trying to heal is we can, we can ask ourselves the question, like whatever you're feeling, when you're in the healing phase and you're, you're like, you just broke up with them, you're slowly going no contact and so on, whatever you feel, assume that's what they want you to feel. But why just there? Why just at the end of the relationship and after? Why not just say for the whole relationship from the very beginning to the end of it, or you may still be living in it now, if they're such good button pushing machines, whatever you feel, just assume, check, because it might not be the case. But as a first level assumption, as you go through your checklist, so we have multiple levels of redundancy in the healing process, in the therapeutic process. This is how I feel. I'm really angry right now, but I don't know why I'm not normally an angry person. Well, let's assume that they want you to feel that way. And let's check, let's, let's talk about that. Let's analyze that. Let's rationally think about that and think, well, what would be the benefit in that? I'm really angry right now. Let's assume that they want you to feel angry. Let's assume that they're button pushing you to feel angry. I love them so much. Well, let's ask the question if you really do, or if you're being button pushed into these artificially induced emotions and feelings of obsession. The sex is so good. Is it? Is it? Check again. Look again. I, this is don't, I'm not shaming anybody. I've done this multiple times, even knowing everything I know about narcissistic abuse and red flags and, and all this and that. I've still gone through it and I've still said the same things. One of the things I wanted to finish on is like uh, for this particular chapter of this video, because I then need to do the second chapter of the video is a lighter point. Um, over the years, I've noticed with clients, I've never done this, but I've seen clients do it where they will hyper idealize their narcissistic partner to such an extent that it becomes comical. So I've had clients say to me, not all, like this isn't all clients, but some, a percentage of clients will compare their partner 
to a famous actor or model or singer or celebrity. Comparisons to Angelina Jolie, comparisons to Sean Connery, comparisons to, uh, what's his name? Johnny Depp, I was gonna say Jack Sparrow, uh, Johnny Depp, so on and so forth. And then when you actually, they insist on showing you a picture of them. Ah, oh, she's so beautiful. He's such a handsome man. All the women, I remember the Sean Connery one. I'm so sorry to do this. And if the lady is watching, please forgive me. I hope you've recovered and you can see the, the funny side. <laughs> she said, well, you know, he's just such a beautiful man. And I think he was like a spiritual um, uh, narcissist. So he had like a little cult around him. He looks like Sean Connery. Like when I saw him, I thought that's Sean Connery, she said to me. And she insisted on sending me a picture. <laughs> This guy, some scruff who looked like a hobo, meth head, with a ponytail and a flat cap on, was missing teeth. <laughs> and she was like, that's the spit of Sean Connery. And I'm like, that's the Sean Connery you get when you order from Wish, maybe. <laughs> Another woman said to me she was dating a guy who's just, just like Johnny Depp. And she insisted on, I didn't ask. I've never asked this. It was back when I used to do coaching on Skype and then they would just send it through on Skype without my consent. And the, the, look, the guy was handsome. He was, a, he was an English guy. He was, he was a handsome, he was a good looking guy, no doubt. But you couldn't, I was just sat there going, look at the shape of his face. Look at the shape of Johnny Depp's face, the nose, the chin. The, he looks nothing like me. He's male. <laughs> He's similar age. They, they both have those little specks in the hairdo, but they don't, have, they don't look the same. This and this, ha this has happened multiple, multiple, multiple times. We become submerged in their fantasy version of themselves. So if we're in this shared fantasy space and part of their fantasy is their false self because they're either super intellectual, they're, you know, the, the, they're just intellectual powerhouses. And then you look at what they're actually doing and what they're saying and you find that most of their information you get off the first page of Wikipedia and it goes no deeper than that, but they've learned the first page of Wikipedia on that subject and they can reel it off in a way that makes them sound like really intellectual or that they're the most sexually desirable person in the room or they're the wealthiest and you find out they're thieves and they have a string of debt behind them, whatever, right? We enter that fantasy space and part of that fantasy space is you love me, you adore me, you never felt like this about anybody. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? It's like, um, you know, the old school idea of hypnosis and you'd have like a guy with pointy eyebrows and uh, probably like a little beard like mine, like this, being like, me, you love me. <laughs> you know, arrows coming out of his thing, you love me. Mesmerizing people and hypnotizing them into this trance. It's artificial. Consider, I'm not, in all sincerity, joking aside, I'm not telling you what you feel. This is a video that's, an individual speaking to a mass of people with a mass of different experiences and backgrounds and what I couldn't say. I can't tell you to, an, but it's watched by an individual. I can't tell you what your experience has been. Consider the possibility though, that some of your feelings and some of your cognitions about this person are artificially induced and that you really don't love them like that. And you're not obsessed with them like that. And the sex wasn't that, <laughs> sex wasn't that amazing. <laughs> or whatever it is that is the hook that keeps you in, look at the hook, look at it again, and just consider the possibility that what's happened is you've fused and merged with their narrative and their false, sense, uh, their false self and their grandiose idealized sense of who they are, and you've imbibed it in order to be in the relationship because that's the trade-off. You get with somebody who's narcissistic, you must accept their narrative of who they are. There are other things you can deny. There are other things you can fight them on. There's other things you can say no to, but not that, because you'll never get into an intimate relationship with a narcissist if you deny their fundamental narrative of who they are. True or false? Disagree with me if you like, but put it in the comments below. So you might have noticed that I don't put adverts on these YouTube videos. If you haven't paid for YouTube Premium, um, you can just watch the, my videos unimpeded but I will start putting my own adverts for my own products inside of the videos. Today I want to talk to you about the Loving Inner Guide course. Um, if you didn't do the Silence the Inner Critic course or the Heal the Super Ego course where you found that over facing or too much, the Loving Inner Guide course is for you. 
What it trains you to do is to develop a better relationship with yourself between different parts of yourself. So that if you find that during the healing process you're getting very frustrated and very angry with yourself and you start bullying yourself and then you drop into an emotional flashback of dissociation or freezing or depression and you don't want to engage in like a challenging course to help with that, this one is for you. The Loving in a Guide course is simple, it's straightforward, it comes in five modules, it has five chapters. Um, there's really simple exercises to do with it. It's not triggering, it's not challenging, and it's available now from a Spartan Life Coach from, hit this link, it's either on this side or this side, and you can go and get it now, and it's $25. It'll take you about five or six days to, to consume if you give it like half an hour a day, and if you work on the techniques in there for about 20 to 30 days for about 15 minutes a day, you will have a significantly better relationship with yourself and that negative, nasty, nagging, bullying in a voice will cool off. So that's the Loving in a Guide course. You can get it from this link and uh, it's $25 and you can start using it straight away. We now have a different platform where if you get a course, you're automatically given access to an app that you can download for free and you can do all the courses now off your phone super convenient. I am, uh, I have to, this is chapter two. I have to admit, I am, I'm not quite in the right mood for this video. I'm actually really happy today. I'm very cheerful and it's quite a heavy subject. Um, I hope this isn't grating on anyone. <laughs> like I'm in a really good mood today and we're talking about heartache and the life ruining personality destroying manipulations and machinations of, of the narcissist. Part of the mood is, is also relief, by the way. Um, because for me, I've, I've been, this is pure, this is codependent guilt. I was like, you can't, you can't just say, you can't just say I didn't feel what I felt I felt because you sound like a bitter teenager. I never even loved you anyway. I never even liked you anyway. I was only playing. But at the same time as that thought was in my mind, the cognitive dissonance was there, I, I kind of knew that it was artificial. Not entirely. I, I think in my relationships where I loved, I really loved. Where I attached, I really attached. But not like that. Not in the way that I thought. So in the sweating, psychotic fever dream uh, during the relationship and then after the relationship, the extreme emotional dysregulation and the sense that like, oh, I've lost the love of my life was false. And I know it was false. And I even saw, I was so worried, hyper-conscientious, riddled with guilt and shame, that sometimes in the way I was recovering from the relationships, it, I could observe myself and say, this is not, this is not how someone who has been in love would recover. This is not how somebody who's really been in love recovers. And I even started thinking, maybe I'm a psychopath because I'd have moments where I would switch off, see the person with crystal clear clarity and be like, you know, and I would look at the, the personality and the person and the way they acted. And I'd be like, that's just, that's just a weak structured person. That's a person with really weak boundaries with, that's a poorly formed person who needs therapy, not a boyfriend. And then the moment would pass. And then, and then I'd go back into, the, into, back into what I suppose was effectively the shared fantasy space. Though the person isn't even there, the shared fantasy space is still accessible to us even after the relationship has ended. And I'd be like, no, because she was perfect, because she was amazing, and she does this, and she does that, and she's special because X, Y, and Z, which is narcissistic in and of itself, if you think about it. What we fall in love with typically in a relationship is what is special about that person. But what is special about that person is, I'm not saying that that indicates NPD or that you're NPD or that that means they are, but think of the narcissism. Think of the way in which narcissism and and a fantasy version of ourselves is an intrinsic part of pair bonding. And I'm not, I'm not one of these guys who's like, so therefore never get into a relationship again. I'm saying just be aware of that, that there's a gamey element to this. I'm back in therapy myself. If you watch the Richard Grant and Philosophy channel, you'll know that and you'll know why. Um, and I'm doing, my psychotherapist is uh, uh, 
trans is his background is transactional analysis, and he said that Eric Byrne said, "We're never not playing games. We're never not playing a game." So even therapy becomes a game in the Byrne transactional analysis sense. So you're never out of it. You never top level out of it, but. If you're aware that you're playing a game and you're aware that you can choose to come from adult rather than parent or child and try and relive a script based in childhood trauma, you have a better chance of moving forward and you have a better chance of being honest with yourself and with other people. Which leads me to this uh, final point that I'm going to make. We never really fall in love with the narcissist. What happens is we're ensnared in a folie a deux, a psychosis in a shared fantasy space between two people where you are the lover and they are the beloved and that's it. You do, I think, authentically love to some degree, but that depends on your capacity as a human being to love. Love and romance is this whole subject that probably needs opening up and re-looking at from scratch. Because, you know, simply put, I just don't buy this, uh, this narrative that, it, that it's a democracy and that it's completely open to everybody. I think some people are not capable of love. Sorry, I think there is, no, uh, well, some people are not capable of love. We say narcissistic or, or, or psychopath or narcissistic psychopath, not the borderline. The borderline is capable of love. I would say that, that for everybody beyond cluster B personality disorders, we shouldn't just assume that everybody has a capacity to love that's equal to everybody else. Loving somebody is quite a skill. Loving somebody is quite a strength. The chance that you're going to meet the love of your life the first time around, aged 16, aged 17 or 18, and then love them really well for the rest of your life, if you think the chance of that happening along a long enough timeline shrinks to zero. The only way that can work, the only way I claim, is if that person learns to love through failing to love inside that relationship. So the, what does that mean? It's puppy dogs and rainbows for zero people. It's pure puppy dogs and rainbows for zero people. There are no humans who ever live the Disney fantasy. There never have been and there never will be, is what I'm saying. There'll always be the failure to love or the... the where we, where we crash into our structural weaknesses in love and then move forward from there and then move up from that point. That's the only thing we can do. That's the only option that's, that's available to us. So through failure, we grow. It's a strength. It's a skill. And some people don't have it. They don't have the, they don't have the structural integrity to love another human being. And I'm not even talking narcissism or social media use or cultural narcissism. Forget all that for a second. I'm saying just the average person some people do not have the personal integrity to love another human being in a way that wouldn't be fusing, merging, boundary breaking and somewhat abusive depending on the lens that you look at it at. Okay, final point. We never love the narcissist because we never know the narcissist. You cannot love a person you don't know. That's not true. And if you fall in love with a fantasy, you're always be, sorry, I know it's offensive. I know it's insulting. You're an adult. I'm an adult and I'm telling you, you didn't love. And you're like, I'm effing well dead. Leave me alone. Okay, I'm making a claim. Think about it. If it's just a thought experiment, you pick it up, you wrestle with it for two days. You're like, I don't like the way that makes me feel, but I'm going to think about it. And you throw it out. Fine, fine. But at least you wrestled with it and you had to think about it. Here's another big claim for you that really tick people off, really trying not to swear on my videos these days. It's akin, it's more akin to a teenage crush on a pop star than it ever is to real authentic love that can last, which means it's doomed to failure. It's going to have a cycle and it's going to go up, 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 down, 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 splat. Well, if that's not a description of all of my relationships, I don't know what is. This is more to do with, and, and people say, oh, this is about lust. I don't like that. I don't like it because I think it's dismissive. 
And I don't think it's true. I actually think it's inaccurate. There are people out there who love saying, you're not in love, you're in lust. And I'm like, do you like saying that? Because they're both four letter words and it's like an alliteration, l and l. Do you think that sounds smart? Because it, you know, it, it fits neatly together. It's a dumb thing to say, please don't say it. Because it's really not, it's really not. And it's, um, it's wrong. It's just inaccurate. It's just inaccurate. I don't believe that people engage in relationships that are abusive and stay there only because of lust. We're, we as humans are dumb in some ways. We are dumb animals in some ways, but we're not that dumb. You don't stick around repeatedly to be abused and used uh, by somebody because they make your new new tingle. I, I just don't, I don't believe that. I, I never have. In my heart of hearts, I've never believed it. And when you look at like a teenager's crush on a pop star or a celebrity, yes, there's elements of hormonal activation there. And of course there's lust there, but it's way more powerful than that. It's more akin to an endogenous, internally created drug that creates a real high, a real high. Yes, lust will do that. Yes, orgasms will do that. But this is beyond that. This is something else. And I think we need to have that conversation. We need to recognize it. I don't have no dogma for you here today. I'm just saying, let's talk about that. Let's recognize it. Because the teenager is infantile and unguarded and they're not loving. It's adulation. They're worshiping. You, what they do, you must do from your knees. I'm probably going to regret saying that afterwards. I mean, in terms of, get your minds out the gutter. I mean, in terms of worship, in terms of uh, supplication, bowing, scraping, fawning on the knees. That's this type of love. And it's from, it's from below upward. That's not two human adults coming together with full consent and full awareness and engaging in something. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the same thing. It's doomed. It's doomed unless you're in a culture and in a, a personality type and, in, and within a lifestyle that permits you to live in worship. But for most of us, it's too, it's too aggravating to the ego. It's too, it creates narcissistic injury in us because we're being used as slaves. Okay, less instructive, more of an exploration of topics, but I, I believe it was useful. I hope it was useful. You will let me know via likes and comments and distributions whether you found it useful or not. Um, final word on the Loving in a Guide course. It's a good course. It's easy to consume and it can really, really help you if you're getting frustrated and angry with yourself and you have a tendency to speak to yourself in a not very nice way. You should consider getting that course now. Um, if you liked this video, give it a like. We have another video for you right here. Please subscribe and think about getting this course. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and your attention. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Cheers.